right now. The Argos are playing the Alouettes. I know you're all big CFL fans, but it's that kind of sacrifice that I'm making that I hope you appreciate, you know, to be here with you guys. I have a kid who's going to McGill, and I used to go down for the odd game. And if it wasn't for you guys, I'd be there today with him at McGill Stadium, cheering against the Argos, which upsets uh, some of my masters at the star no end, but there you go. So welcome, my name is Dan Smith, and uh, you saw those big posters, apparently I'm a star of the star, and I love that, it's forever. <laughs> they always pull out a photo of me with no hair, which is really bothersome, because one well, of these days I'm going to sneak in and get one of those really old photos where I have hair and I'm tall and stuff, but uh, uh, who knows. So, how many of you folks uh, read the star? That's yeah. Excellent. I told you, I mean, we're, we're at home. We're here. <laughs> and I always ask, how many of you still read the, the old print version of the star? Yeah. My, we're old. <laughs> how many of you tend to read this on the net or tablets or that kind of jazz? See, not too yeah. many. Okay, that's good. So, what we found over the years is uh, most of the folks that come to this tent are usually star readers and they sort of know the place, right? So we try to keep it sort of in the family. And uh, so thanks for coming. Uh, my job at the Star, I'm the editor of those uh, weekend insight sections, the Smarty Pants sections that are on Saturday and Sunday, which means I'm very deep and uh, all that jazz. So you'll see a keen intellect applied here. There's only one rule here, which is that I make up the rules. and. Uh, Sometimes that's necessary when we're dealing with politics, like we're about to get into right now. Um, if you've come here and want to trash these star folks because of their vicious attacks on our fine mayor, etc., that's okay with me as long as you're witty about it. Okay? Yeah. If if you start to get dull or Hector. Uh, we'll probably do something about it. Our union at the Star is uh, in merger talks with the auto workers, and they're in big strike mode these days. And they keep settling deals. Uh, so we've got a few of them sprinkled throughout the grounds here, just in case. So uh, if you see large men stand beside you and a big hook come out, that means wrap it up, okay? <laughs> so without to do, we're going to talk for the next 50 minutes or so, or you guys too, on uh, City Hall. We did this last year and it was a hoot because Rob Ford was in uh, office for just about a year and uh, we were all still a bit amazed and puzzled at what we'd done as a city. <laughs> now that we're two years into the uh, Ford regime, I think uh, it's become more of a set piece, but I'm sure you might have the odd uh, question for these folks about uh, what it's like to cover Rob and are they paid to hate the mayor and those kinds of things. You know. We can ask those things. So starting off, on my far left is uh, Irene Gentle. And Irene's new to this gathering. Uh, Irene is our city editor at the Toronto Star. She came to us uh, previously from the Hamilton Spectator. And she's only taken over the toughest job at the Star about six weeks ago. The city editor is the hardest job in the paper because you got to cover, you got the largest number of uh, reporters and photographers. Uh, covering Toronto is our bread and butter, so it's a uh, kind of a presser job, and uh, we're really thrilled to have Irene take that up for us. And Irene, I don't know if you've met David and Robin, they're your employees, they're sitting to your right. <laughs> uh, the guy in the middle is a guy named David Ryder. David has a lovely job. He's the City Hall Bureau Chief for the Toronto Star. <laughs> like, uh, your metaphor, but uh, it's, it's, it's not the easiest thing in the world, I'm sure. Well, David's been here for 20 years, you know. We can't get rid of the guy. He's worked at a bunch of different newspapers. He's worked for Reuters, he's worked for CBC, 
And uh, he's also been a high school teacher, which I think is the most honorable thing he's done with his life to date. Okay? So, David, thanks for coming back. Uh, David was with us last year, so he knows what uh, to expect with you folks. And just to my immediate left is Robin Doolittle. Robin's been at City Hall since the, uh, the last election. Robin's a reporter who works for David and for Irene. Uh, she just got back from the London Olympics, where she covered the Olympics for us and had a ball there, I hope. And uh, so there we go. So that's the four of us. I should warn you that uh, David, Robin, these two work for Irene now. And uh, if you folks out there don't applaud their every word and act really <laughs> friendly towards them, etc., Irene will be taking notes. And there's always back to the police speak for you, Robin, <laughs> and the night radio room for you, David. <laughs> Irene is not my boss, and she can't do anything to me. <laughs> Although the people who will be here later surely can. <laughs> so I'm going to start off by uh, asking these uh, folks a question. But mostly I'm going to throw it out to, to you folks. and. Uh, Whatever you might feel like asking them within the bounds of the rule that I said earlier, please please have at it. Now, I was going to ask, um, does the Toronto Star pay you to hate Rob Ford? But we've already gotten a laugh for that, so that's probably not too fair. But I've done, done some research, guys. Here we have it. Last week, Rob Ford was on his radio show a week today. And he said of you guys, they're all connected. They won't stop. They don't believe in democracy. You got your lefties. You got the media. They don't do their due diligence. They just sit on their ass. <laughs> He's right. He's right. Here they are. They're sitting on their ass. So, you know, it just goes to show the mayor is pretty accurate. Who knows? So other than sitting on your ass, folks, I just want to ask you, especially Robin, David, we'll start with you two, what's it like covering Rob Ford for the Toronto Star? Uh, you folks should know that the mayor's office doesn't talk to the star, the mayor doesn't talk to the star, and uh, from my seat that's kind of a badge of honor, but as an old reporter, that would be passing strange how to cover somebody uh, if they won't talk to you. It reminds me of my ex-marriage in some ways. <laughs> so, David, you're the bureau chief. You're the guy that's supposed to answer to Irene each day. And she says, what did the mayor say today? And you go, I don't know. He doesn't talk to us. And she says, that's no excuse. But, but seriously, how do you go about day to day when the mayor of Canada's biggest city doesn't talk to you guys? Well, I always say that uh, the, the mayor's office has kind of declared war on the star, but we're not at war with the mayor's office. I mean, we cover him like we cover David Miller or Mel Lastman or anybody else, which is you go in, you ask the questions, you figure out what the issues are, what you think readers need to know. If the mayor doesn't want to answer, there's his brother. <laughs> uh, if his brother doesn't want to answer, there's the deputy mayor. If nobody will answer, there's Krista Ford. No. Uh, there's, there's lots of people who are willing to present the mayor's point of view on a given subject. And so we do our best to get that. There's, so, there's the official kind of, we can call up, if the issue is about roads or paving, we can call Denzel Min and Wong, who is the chair of public works, who is in constant contact with the mayor's office. Um, and then there's also the back channel stuff, which is, there's the calls where you you know phone the mayor's office and say I want to speak to Rob Ford, and there's the more kind of covert people who are affiliated with the mayor or in the mayor's office or know the mayor well, who we phone and we say, so Rob was on the radio talking about bag tax again. Like, what's he going to do about that? Is he really going to get rid of it? Um, and they'll say, no, oh, he just somebody got his talk, had him on the phone about it all night, so that's he was in his head, but you know it's not really. In, in this case, finally, he did do it. That, that's actually a conversation I had a long time ago. Um, so there's lots of ways to do it, and at the end of the day, we do it like we would with anybody else. And I'm sure there have been times, I wasn't in the bureau covering the last one, say, I, did, I was there for the last part of the David Miller regime. I'd say David Miller was no fan of the Toronto Star in the last 10 months I covered him. 
In fact, when I was there, we got less behind the scenes cooperation or information from the mayor's office than we did when actually Mayor Ford came in. Uh, that's changed a little bit, and I'd say now we're getting less than we used to. But um, so, yeah, it's really just covering him like you would anybody else and doing, honestly, our best to fairly present his point of view or his office's point of view. And Robin, what's it like for you? Yeah, I don't really, uh, I don't like think about it a lot. I mean, in terms of any sort of different relationship between the star and the mayor's office, people often ask me, oh my God, how do you report on that office when they have such a fight with the star? They don't talk to you. Um, I mean, they don't send us press releases, and that's really irritating, but um, it's not, you know, something that we're not working around. And uh, as far as I can tell, the only person that the mayor talks to is Stephen LeDrew. So, I mean, it's not like we're really missing out on that. And we have great, you know, pretty good relationships with his staff and the people um, at City Hall. And, uh, and yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a wacky world, but it's really entertaining and, and we, we work around it. Well, are they brave? When I joined the Toronto Star, it's my seventh paper, but uh, they were all out west before that. I was hired as uh, a foreign correspondent to be their first uh, permanent reporter based west of Thunder Bay, and first Edmonton and then Vancouver. So here's something you could try. I got the Star to print up these business cards, and it said my name, and it said Foreign Correspondent, Western Canada Bureau. And so when... Uh, Premier Lahey, whose uh, memorial service was held Friday, or Alan Blakeney, or some of these other titans of confederation would start to lean in on me about being an agent of central Canadian perfidy and evil Toronto and all this stuff. I'd just say, hey, stop. I'm a Blue Bomber fan. I'm from Winnipeg. And here's my foreign correspondence card. And I tended to cut right through that stuff. But uh, I don't envy you your lot. So Irene, how do you assess the performance of these two uh, when they're not even allowed to talk to the mayor? I mean, yeah. will they get a bonus if they get them fired? Is that is that the deal, or uh, how, how do you assess their work? Or? Nobody wants to get them fired. Actually, that is an important point. Nobody wants to get the mayor fired. Nobody is looking for anything but papers. No, it's not true. Oh, yeah. <laughs> The way, I would assess, sorry, the way I would assess is just if we're doing um, honest and fair reporting, if we're doing tough, honest, fair, accurate reporting, and they are doing that in a very difficult situation. They are doing it, have to go in through a lot of channels that others wouldn't have to go to. But basically, as David said, David Miller actually didn't talk to us for a year and a half. Um, with the, when he ended his term, he gave a farewell interview to everybody but the star. We're not unused to mayors who have a hard time with our coverage because we do our, the same thing with every mayor tough but fair. The way they react is different, and that's kind of where all this perception comes in that we're at war. Again, we're not at war. We're just trying to do a public service by telling people what's actually happening with taxpayer money. Whether people decide that they care about that, that's up to them. Our job is just to put it out there. I gotta tell you, you know, that was a very professional series of answers we just heard. <laughs> Some of it's crap. Because, <laughs> if, not you, Irene. But <laughs> if I'm a reporter and I'm covering City Hall, okay, do do I care if Rob Ford, or for the star, I mean, do I care if Rob Ford is re-elected? Oh yes, I say a prayer to Holy Mary every night, saying, "Please let Rob be re-elected." Please, as long as I have this job, because what could be more fun than to have this weird thing going on if you're covering City Hall for the Toronto Star? It would be a hoot. Actually, did I add on that note? I should have said that I'm the male bespectacled Star City Hall reporter. I'm not the one who faced the cock fist, but I am the one who was asked, are you going to be sleeping with me tonight? <laughs> and the answer was no. I want that on the record. The answer is actually, I hope not. <laughs> That's right. See, once again, there's a bullet he could have taken for the team. <laughs> he could have sucked with Rob. No, no, you wouldn't. Take a note, Irene. So, I have a couple of questions, but I'm going to save them, and just in case you folks don't want to get up right away. So, who's first, sir? And by the way, I'll always repeat the question, okay? So if you can't hear it over there or over there, don't worry about it. 
I'll repeat the question, try not to skew it out of any recognition, and then we'll get to the answer. Okay, go ahead, sir. Um, do you have an extensive pre-written account of his departure from office already? The, qu the question is, have you already written the story about how he leaves office? <laughs> Uh, I'll take this one. So, um, yeah, people, I think it's funny because when you live in, and work in the environment that we do, you live in kind of a, a political bubble. And I suspect a lot of you people, if you come out on a Sunday to listen to City Hall reporters talk about covering a municipal government, you're also in a bit of a bubble. Um, people love Rob Ford. Like, they love him. And I, uh, you know, in my outside of journalism world, um, a lot of people I interact with still love him and often don't uh, don't hear about some of the stuff that gets other people quite uppity. I I think no one should discount Rob Ford. I think that that is something that he has proven time and time again. And um, I think it's very likely that he will win re-election. So, oh, listen, guys, listen. I'm telling you. I am telling you. Um, just on that note, I would say that, I mean, the polls, if you believe polls, pretty regularly say that if he faces one tough opponent, uh, there's a good chance Mayor Ford would lose. If he faces two or more credible candidates, which is the, by far the most likely scenario, he will win the election. I mean, you figure he's, he's basically, he won with a 47% crowd, 40% of the vote, 47% of the vote. Most most people estimate he has about 20 to 25 percent hardcore supporters who are not going to waver. They're mostly older, mostly suburban, and those are the people that t tend to vote. A lot of the young, say, university people who really don't like the mayor are the people who tend not to vote. And, and one other thing I'll add um, to people, again, not in the bubble, because if you're in the bubble, you have really strong opinions about rules he's broken or you know the you know the legal stuff that he has problems with sometimes. If you're outside of the bubble and you kind of are getting news filtered to you through friends or other ways, you know, you hear, yeah, he has these kind of character fiascos. Um, but, I don't know how else to say it. Uh, I think that, you know, is some of the stuff that we've written about and the, the colorful situations he's gotten into unexpected? I don't think so. I, you know, watched this guy before and I think he is who he is and he's never tried to hide who he is, and I think a lot of the people outside of the bubble think, yeah, but that's that's Rob Ford. We knew that. We voted for him, and he's getting control of the spending down at City Hall, and um, and that's what they hear. So that, that's that's what's always really interesting for us. I think we're always very conscious of when we when we write is, um, uh, yeah, you can't you can't discount this guy, and he is you know politically very smart. So, uh, sir. I mean, is there anything that's off limits when it comes to covering the mayor, or is he a public figure, and you know what, he wanted a public life, he went for this. For example, I'm thinking of KFC. When, the ta when it was taken KFC, there was a lot of online comments that when the star ran an online story, saying, you know what, guys, you're kind of picking on too far. Is there, are there limits? Okay, the, que the question to Irene, the city editor of the star, was, uh, is it are there any limits when you're covering Rob Ford, given the uh, animosity that he seems to have for the paper? And specifically, why didn't you guys rag on him for eating a Kentucky Fried Chicken the way it did? It's actually an excellent question because that's actually a really good, that was a really good issue. Um, so first of all, the answer is he is, uh, there is no more or less off limits than any other public figure. Again, there's not special rules for Rob Ford. It's the same as any other public figure. KFC, though, um, we went through a lot of uh, a lot of talk about whether or not what to do with that and, and whether or not to do anything with that. We didn't actually run it first. Um, we waited for other media to do it. We, we held it back intentionally. Um, then, when other media did do it, we initially put it actually quite high on our website and immediately dropped it somewhere where it was lower. It still did very, very well online, I won't lie to you. It was very popular. But we actually, again, we didn't put it up first. Uh, and then we dropped it to where it wouldn't be the most obvious thing or even the first five most obvious things when people came up. Because, because you know what, it was actually because of the laughter in the background. He himself had put his weight as an issue. He had made that a public issue. So that was part of the reason why we put it up at all. The laughter in the background just seemed kind of mean. Right? That's why we tried to drop it the way we did. Um, but it was out there. The story was out there. The story was out there in all kinds of other media. We didn't start that story. Um, we. 
went with it the same as everybody else did, and I would say even more low key than many others. Can I jump in here on that one too? Sorry. That man make me made me wake up every Monday morning early to get to City Hall to watch him weigh in. Okay, they had a big celebration. They carted in this antique, you know, weigh scale. And listen, that's not something you want to do every Monday morning. But we had to be there because at the end of the day, he took questions from the media. I also think, in general, it's a very valid issue. Um, I'm I'm really interested in, in health and personal health, and I think that the initiative was a great one from. The Ford brothers to say, you know what, we want to do this together and make this an issue, get a public health campaign and come on and join us, and we were there covering it. So if the guy's going to make me do this, and then suddenly it's like, and I'm getting, you know, having some KFC and sneaking it on the side, that's just a funny story that I think we absolutely were able to run. There's a reason that people wanted to read it, and it's because they were reading about him on his public weight loss campaign. I don't think it's bad either. The guy's totally entitled to have some chicken. It's just one of those things that you can look at him and relate to him and go, yeah, I'm on a diet, and you know what? I love KFC too, and I sneak, and I can't lose weight either, Rob. I'm there with you. That's one of those issues that helped him, if anything, and made him more, you know, not that he could be more personable, but um, <laughs> yeah, I think that like, I got in fights on Twitter with people about that. I 100% think that that is a completely valid story. And if you notice, the second that he dropped his weight loss campaign, we would never run that story now. I, I absolutely believe that if, if right now someone sent us a picture of him eating some chicken, we would never run it. And for instance, at council, he was, um, this came up when he was losing, when he started the weight loss campaign, people talked about his love of chicken. Because at council, he would often order big buckets of chicken. And uh, we, you know, that's just one of those little details that you never see in print because it's not important. But when it's put front and center, it is valid to cover. I'll just, I'll just add to that that uh, Daniel Dale did the story. It was actually a fairly small story, and it was really written from the point of view of when you make your weight a political issue, which is an unusual thing to do, that strange things are going to happen, including somebody videotaping you just going and getting chicken. It wasn't written in a way to ridicule the mayor, and it didn't ridicule the mayor. And then what happens is it gets picked up, for, exact, for example, the Sun sort of criticized us for doing the story and ran three times as much coverage yeah. of it. Talk radio says, a terrible star, and then spent hours talking about it. And the mayor's office, too, as part of their normal ongoing strategy, will take something that they think the star says and then say, oh, this is terrible, they're, they're being mean to us, they're being terrible to us. When in fact, if you really look at what we wrote or what we said, it was very, very modest and it wasn't like that. The only other thing I'll add is, you know, as part of a weird, part of the weird part of my job is receiving regular emails from people saying, I saw Rob Ford doing this at this such a time and here's a photo and here's this and here's that. And, you know, I think it's wrong or it's questionable behavior or whatever. And sometimes we check it out, sometimes I don't. And the bottom line, we've had lots of interesting things that if we put it out there, people would talk about it and it would certainly be gossip worthy, it would get hits on the website, but we haven't. And the main reason is, does it affect his job as a mayor? Does it, does it affect his professional duties? Or so is it something that he put out there, like the weight loss challenge? Yeah, which is a totally different thing. So the idea that we're just scrounging around looking for stuff that's going to embarrass the mayor is completely false. I can't wait to see him, uh, what you guys do with uh, when he's spotted driving his SUV in the garden or reading his briefing notes and eating Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> yeah, I read about that. That's great. You, you guys see him doing that. Take a picture and send it to me and I'd love to write about that. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yeah, um, this is for Robin. I follow you on Twitter and I notice that every time you cover something, there's a huge backlash against you and some of it's getting a little bit personal. How do you deal with that? The question to Robin is... Uh, uh, the lady who asked the question is a follower of Robin on Twitter and says that uh, anytime you seem to get involved in anything, there's a huge backlash and it's getting a bit personal against you, which is news to me. So what's that about and how do you handle it? Yeah, well, one, tell us to a plug. It's at Robin Doolittle. <laughs> and send me a note. Tell me who you are and I'll respond to you. Um, yeah, I get... Uh, uh, I get a lot of personal stuff, people going after me because I'm a woman or making comments about my appearance or stuff people want to do to you. And uh, it's so irritating. Um, I try not to get sucked into it. I block people. Um, if they get one, they get a one offense, then they are blocked. Um, I just think it's sad and, and pathetic. And uh, because I know that, you know, a lot of these people 
are in the bubble that I'm in and would never say things to my face because if they ever did, I would make them cry. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's really, it's yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't, I mean, hurt my feelings. It makes me very angry. And I also just think of, you know, in, in general, women who are in, involved in journalism and politics, some of them aren't maybe as thick-skinned as I am. Um, and it, I, I know it really impacts some of the women that I know. And uh, um, there's been uh, some great speaking events, Women's Politics in Toronto. Did I say that right? Yeah, is that right? Um, and they do some great stuff on that and address these issues. So, yeah. If you're listening, trolls, come up and say to my face. <laughs> I really sympathize, Robin, because every time I do this each year, there's handsome women lined up down the block when I leave. It's just, it's a terrible burden, I know. Just, uh, sir? Uh, can we move beyond four to the other 44 members of council? Why? Boring. <laughs> yeah. And uh, how do they relate to Stonewall, like Ford, uh, how are generally are they performing? Who are the good performers who are disappointed and uh, so on? So the question from the gentleman was, uh, Rob Ford is just one member of council after all. What about the other 44? Do you have normal relationships with them? Does that help you manage to cover the city adequately, etc.? David? Uh, I'll just say, I mean, I, I feel a little comfortable saying who's a disappointment because that's kind of not our job. Um, I will say just on the relationship with the star, most of the 44 we have a great relationship with. Uh, members of, of, of Mayor Ford's inner circle like Denzel Min Wong, Doug Holliday, um, um, uh, yeah, Peter Milchin, regularly not only do we talk to them, but they pop by our office and sit down and we have a chat. Um, one notable exception, I would say, is uh, the budget chief, Councillor Mike Dobran. He, in my feeling, actually has frozen us out more than the mayor's office. He really does not speak to the star. I think the only time he did, is, since I took over the bureau two and a half years ago, was uh, a suitably strange story, which was that the, a large rat was caught in his office. And uh, uh, our, colleague, our colleague Paul Maloney, who is very unassuming and hard to be rude to, called him and got him on the phone and he confirmed that in fact a large rat was in his office. Um, he, uh, and I, yeah, I've tried to, I've tried to break uh, that log jam with no success and I know that um, in the in the t 2010 election, the star does a, uh, the editorial page, which has nothing to do with us, basically endorses uh, candidates in each ward. In his ward, we did not endorse a candidate and said all of them were unimpressive. He cut that out, and it, it last I was there, it's hanging framed on, on the wall of his office. So I think for him it's a very personal feeling about the Toronto Star. Unfortunately for us, he's the budget chief. So again, that's just another thing where we don't get interviews with him, we don't get uh, press releases from his office. Device. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the, yeah. <laughs> so it just makes yeah. our job that much harder and puts us in the awkward position sometimes of asking for cooperation from our competitors on one of the most competitive beats in our country. If you are interested in journalists who are actually paid to have opinions and express them publicly, our next hour we'll have three of those folks up. So we'll, we'll deal with exactly that topic. So, so, so. Sir. Um, my name is Himi Syed. I don't, that doesn't matter. My question that, that, is question. New York, Calgary, St. Paul, Minneapolis, even Chicago has a mayor that was not previously elected alderman or councillor. Do city councillors make the worst mayors? The question was, uh, all the, a lot of other cities in uh, North America, you don't have to be a city councillor to then become mayor, but it seems that Toronto tends to elect uh, as mayors people who were city councillors. Uh, is that a good thing for Toronto or a bad thing? I, I might be totally wrong here, but I don't think we've ever had a mayor who's not been a mayor. They know the city, they know the file, um, they know the staff, they know how things work. Um, you saw covering the, the campaign, it took, you know, Rocco, George, Sarah, a, a good, I'd say, six months to be able to really speak uh, eloquently and properly about the process at City Hall. I mean, they did figure it out, but it took a long time, and they'll, I think they'll each say this, that it was a, a pretty big learning curve to be able to speak kind of eloquently about how things work at City Hall. So it's a huge advantage if you're actually a councillor. Um, and and I, I suspect that the next mayor of Toronto will have been a councillor. 
Yeah, I, the only thing I add is that I, I'm a big believer in the voters never wrong. So as far as you know, they make the worst mayors. Uh, we got the mayor that people wanted, and, and that's the way it is. And and what they do in office is up for lots of people to judge. But we're just really, I don't know what it sounds like a cop-up, but we're really in the business of saying, here's what they're doing, and then letting the people decide. I got to, personally, I agree with this gentleman in a sense, because, uh, you know, in Calgary, you got a mayor who's really rejuvenated the city. Uh, he's not a, a, a moneyed white guy. He's... Uh, a man of color who's really opened Calgary's image up to the rest of the country. And uh, I think there's great virtue to a city to have uh, more access to uh, outsiders, if you will. Because you guys keep talking about inside the tent and all that stuff. Populism can be a dangerous thing. Rob Ford ran against City Hall, didn't he? As a longtime councillor. Uh, so it depends what you mean by uh, somebody who's inside the tent or outside the tent. But that's the fun about politics. Yes, sir. Um, in doing your job, how important is it to get access to senior management, let's say non-elected officials, uh, to provide background? And, and has that access changed under the new administration? And are they less, are they as open or less, more open? Or well, less open? The, the, please be wrong. The uh, question from the gentleman was, uh, uh, Given what's going on with Ford's office, uh, has your relationship as reporters changed with senior bureaucrats at City Hall? Are they more willing to talk to you and fill in the gap, or are they less willing or intimidated, I take it, in terms of being able to do uh, the normal briefing they used to do with reporters? I guess one thing, maybe I didn't make this clear before, with the whole us being shut out of the mayor's office, that's pretty much limited to press releases. They don't talk to anybody or any media. Every single media has pretty much the same situation. Now their press guy will respond to other media with a token quote that doesn't add anything to a story and everyone's aware of that. So we can't get that token quote. But other than that, I mean, everyone's kind of dealing with the same situation. Rob Ford just doesn't talk, ever, like to, to media. Um, he speaks on his radio show, we get stuff from there. Um, we, David and I both showed up about, you know, like towards the end of Miller's term. So we were still just kind of learning the ropes. Senior officials um, don't regularly meet with reporters because anything they say can be, can get them in trouble. You obviously build relationships with select ones and I'm sure we both, you know, have relationships with certain individuals, but at the same time, you know, it, it's not necessary per se to do our job. City, um, City of Toronto has great communications people. You can email, you know, there are certain press attaches for, hey, can you figure out what the bylaw is for this obscure road and if there's been any parking tickets on it? Like, they can, they can kind of get back to you on that. And what we do, though, is we file a lot of freedom of information requests with upper management. That's how we get at a lot of the information. Um, I, and I encourage all you guys to do that too, by the way. If you have questions about City Hall, it's just $5 and a piece of paper and send that in. And you can get emails and documents and presentations and handwritten notes and budget numbers. Um, and that's something that our bureau does a lot of. Um, and something that, you know, Doug Ford has said, damn Toronto Star, they just file so many FOIs. And uh, that's something that we do to kind of get around the so-called freeze. But So I wouldn't say it's crucial because they can't really say much anything and even if they did say stuff to us we would be more reluctant to run it um, and kind of burn a source or a bridge. I, I'd have a, I think a slightly different answer in there. I think there has been a change to some degree but I don't know if it affects us any differently than with other media. I mean, I'd say with the Fords in office, I mean it's heads up hockey at City Hall Like, and I would say the examples would be Derek Valentine, former head of TCHC, um, uh, Keiko Nakamura, who is CEO, uh, people who, when the Fords decide that you're not good or they want you out, it's an all-out campaign to go, and there's not a lot of rules about what you don't say about them. Um, one example, too, would be the Chief Medical Officer of Health had the temerity to suggest that more lives would be saved of, of pedestrians if we lowered the speed limits in Toronto. That infuriated the Fords, and they basically went after him on his salary on the radio show and in public comments and said, his salary is embarrassing, who is this guy? So I would say, I would I detect since uh, the Fords came in, 
that there is a little more temerity on the part of senior officials on what they say and who it, and, and it, maybe they'd be more reluctant to say it to us, but I, I get the feeling that probably they're in general uh, a little more cautious with their words because it's not, it might not just be an angry phone call from the mayor's office. It might be public comments that actually disparage their character, which is what we've seen. Well, let's follow that up. Last week we had uh, Public Works repairing the uh, road in front of the Ford family business. I would have loved to have been the bureaucrat in charge of uh, <laughs> Public Works with that going on. So how did you folks deal specifically with that issue? Did they talk to you? Did you get help to explain it? Or was it uh, more stonewalling? Was it difficult? Well, that was a weird story. Um, Daniel Dale, who's uh, one of our colleagues, was told about that story when it was happening and went up and took pictures of it happening and then called the city and asked if, if the mayor or his brother had ordered it and the city said no. Um, it was a private citizen. And then when this most recent story um, occurred about you know whether his staff uh, is coaching football and the question of whether he's missing taxpayer resources, came into uh, play, Daniel called the city back and said, that road thing, are, are you sure that that, that, that wasn't the mayor? Um, and they said, no, absolutely not. So that's an example, I don't know, like was the city purposely trying to mislead us? I will leave that up to you to determine. Um, and that's how we dealt with that. Yeah, the, the justification of the city was that the person who was answering Daniel's questions in both cases was not the most senior person, the most senior person who knew that the mayor's off, the mayor had directly got involved and had convened a meeting with bureaucrats that that, that person was on vacation. Uh, I was being in Chicago all last week and haven't really had a good chance to talk to Daniel, but there obviously are some pretty pointed questions for the city on that, and basically on two occasions they they directly misled us. And they didn't, I, I should, to that excuse that they've said, um, they gave a specific answer, not an I am not sure. They were asked a direct question, and this is not you know, a low-level staffer, this is a, also a senior manager who was speaking, and gave a direct answer to a direct question twice. So, that's all. <laughs> okay, have, yes, ma'am. Well, I have a question. Um, since the past, this past year, the captain seems to have been uh, missing from City Hall. So the crew has taken over. What's the dynamic? Now that the ship is being run by the crew instead of the captain. What, I'm going to ask you to interpret that for me just one bit. When you say the crew has taken over, you mean, I mean the, the nobody's point, running the ship or the, the crew is running the ship? The crew seems to be running the ship as the appearance. The 44 councilors seem to be forming various alliances around different issues to get things happening. Um, okay, I got you now. So, so the question is with Ford being Ford, it seems like different councillors have gotten groups together to try to keep the business city hall going on and transit and other files like that, right? So is that true and is that a phenomenon that's going to continue? Or? So we did an investigation uh, earlier this year that looked at um, Ford's schedules, the meetings that he keeps, um, speaking to individuals uh, within the city who are, you know, high profile developers, businessmen. How often have you seen the mayor? And um, just the straight facts of it show that he is, you know, doing significantly less uh, city work this year than he was this time last year. Um, so that's not disputable. In terms of who's running the city, I mean, I think with any mayor, you have a staff um, that works in the office that provides advice. Um, now David Miller had a larger staff with more advisors and he was bouncing his ideas off of more people. Ford's, you know, got some really strong personalities in there like Mark Tui, um, who are really setting the course for the administration. Um, in terms of the counselors, I mean, the counselors are, they're a fascinating bunch to watch. Some minutes, like, they're strange bedfellows, and you know that the saying is true here. I would not say that the there has been a coalition formed against him. There are case-by-case -case issues that certain councillors come together to block him. But, I mean, look at the Chicago trip. We saw Jay Robinson and Michelle Berardinetti go down. Those are two councillors who voted against the mayor um, quite often in the last year and who are now on a junket with him in Chicago. Is that a signal that maybe they're thinking of rejoining Team Ford, I'm not sure, but certainly there's not a united coalition against the mayor right now at City Hall. 
Yeah, the only guy out is, is uh, Robin mentioned the name Mark Tui, who's the mayor's chief of staff and most formerly is the number two guy who's up. If you were looking for the power behind the throne, most people would, at City Hall, I think, would point to him. And that if there's uh, senior uh, uh, people, city councillors who are, who are committee chairs, uh, if they're going to do something sort of on, uh, on behalf of the mayor, it's pretty inconceivable to me that they would do it without uh, a Mark Tui's blessing. Having said that, the effectiveness is blunted, I, I would say, by the fact that uh, in the last year, um, Mark Tui and the other senior staff have shown an inability to compromise and bring majority councillors on side. So when they have had an initiative like a uh, subway building plan um, or uh, the waterfront makeover that Doug Ford championed, uh, it, it's failed miserably. Yes, ma'am. How are your competitors at City Hall, how are they reacting to the fact that you're frozen out? Are they helping you in any way, or are they just laughing in any way? The, the question is, uh, your, uh, your competing reporters and other news organizations at City Hall, do they feel sorry for you, and do they help you, or do they just laugh at your misfortune? Um. No, our, our colleagues are great, and I mean, we're all, it's, I don't know if you've ever been down to the gallery before, but it's a pretty small little area, and we, you know, we're, in many ways, they're, I'm closer with my colleagues at other newspapers than I am at, with colleagues at, you know, the, the Star, because I work beside them every day, we drink together, we send each other birthday cards. Um, the problem comes in when, you know, Natalie from The Post is out on a story, and she gets a press release, and I'm in the office and she's not immediately like flipping me the the release because it's not her job. If she's across the hall, like, oh by the way, they're scrumming over here. Um, it's just it, it creates this kind of onus on our competitors to send us the press releases. Um, which is not a foolproof plan because if they're not in the office, then of course, you know, the Toronto Star is not the first thing as much as it pains me to say, the first thing on everyone's mind. Um, yeah, I mean, our colleagues are great. I have big issues with our colleagues who talk radio, but I don't, I shouldn't even say call, colleagues, air quotes. Um, someone tweet that. God, those guys are just the worst. But uh, yeah, other than that, I mean, we get along really well with everybody. Yeah, I'll just add, I mean, I'd say there are some, some of us get along better than others. And I'd say, like, for example, we probably get more help from the Post and the Globe than we do from the Sun. And I think that sort of comes from the men. We don't get any help from the Sun. We, yeah. can, we can just throw that. So that's kind of. But I, I think that's more. That's sort of set by the management at the Sun, which is like, oh, we're fighting the star. Um, so they just kind of follow that. Plus, Sue Ann Levy's personality. Uh, uh, and, uh, but yeah, so generally there is more cooperation than most people think. I think some people have an idea, and I understand from if you didn't work in the media, where you think because we're competing with the Post and the Globe and the Sun, that we're all kind of fighting or always hostile to work, almost like the way people perceive the mayor's offices. And, that, and that's actually not true. And a lot of us have worked together at different points. Like, I used to work for the Sun with some of those people. Um, and Natalie Okoba used to work for the Star. And there was actually a funny example of it to me when, so there were a bunch of us were in Chicago, and we were going out to what turned out to be a non-photo event uh, at, um, at a football field, or sorry, a baseball field. And so uh, me, Marcus G from The Globe, Natalie Elkobo from The Post, and Don Peake from The Sun all met together and took a cab, and we all met at a Starbucks, and there was a woman who was visiting who started chatting, and she was like, oh, you're all media, and you're all here from Toronto, and you all, and what, what paper do you, and she thought we all work for the same paper, and we went, oh no, we're the four, we're the four big dailies in town, she's like, and you're together? Like, she thought she'd stumbled on some kind of a, like an unholy alliance or something like that. We're like, oh yeah, well we take a cab, we don't, we don't chat while we're writing our stories, I don't, if I have a scoop, I don't tell them, but personally we're friends. And that's really typical of any beat. Like when I was on the police beat, if you're out with you know your fellow crime reporters and there's a body being dragged out of a dumpster down there and you see it, and you know that just in a you know in 20 minutes everyone's gonna know it's there, you're gonna be like, hey. and then you all kind of walk over. That's just professional courtesy because you know what? Sometimes your tape recorder doesn't work and you miss a quote and you ask a friend like, what was that? Or if you all have a tape, often what happens, for instance, someone's talking, you can't quite hear them, and you kind of all sit down and listen to everyone's tape and figure out. Like, it is, it's just a way that we help to be accurate for, for everybody working together kind of helps that. 
I don't know, sounds a little incestuous to me. <laughs> when I worked out west before the internet age and digital phones and stuff, I actually used to carry little cards saying out of order to put on the pay phones. <laughs> romantic old days. So, you know, I had hair and all that kind of stuff. That's just stuff. you being a jerk. That's yeah. 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 That, that kind of stuff did that kind of still happen. I had one, I'll tell you one quick example. It was a funny one. Is During the campaign, there was a big question about whether John Tory was going to run or not. And I had bugged him and bugged him and bugged him and said, when you decide, you have to let me know like, before anybody. And, and, and we got along quite well. And he had said, well, I don't know. I won't say you're the only one, but I will call you. A bunch of us, it happened to be one of the rare nights, we all got together for drinks. We were at a, a, a patio on Queen Street, and I'm sitting with all my colleagues, and I, got, I get a, a call, and I hear, David, it's John Tory. And I was like, oh, okay, just a sec, John. And I, or I didn't say John, I just, just a sec. And I start wandering away from the table, and he says, I made a decision, and I'm not going to run. And I said, oh, okay, and I made sure I was a far enough way that my colleagues that still at the table can see me, and I just started running. And I was like, <laughs> Street to City Hall and got in my bureau and interviewed him and started running. And the rest of them were like, where's Dave? And, and luckily, I, Robin was still at the table so I could say, pay my bill, I won't be back. And, and then Kelly from The Globe, about 20 minutes later, just similar like, oh, I just got yeah, a, I got a thing with my, oops, gone. So, yeah, I mean, you, know, you also want to like, screw your friends too. And really, like, it's the best way that you can... Sorry. Yes, sir. Uh, both of you have mentioned Chicago, which raises the question for me. How does Ford perceive well outside of the whole GTA bubble? I'm curious because they don't get the same coverage, so does he come off as a buffoon or is he seen as a regular mayor? Just I'm fascinated to find out. The question was. Uh, uh, how is Ford perceived uh, outside of Toronto and other jurisdictions as a, a canny operator or a buffoon? I gotta tell you, out west he's seen as a smart politician. <laughs> Not necessarily a good civic leader who's doing good things for Toronto, but a fairly canny, is that expression, dumb like a fox, right? You know, I, but that's, yeah, I, I would say, uh, so I have... Um, Google alert. So I have, I have my email set up so anytime Rob Ford or Toronto City Council is mentioned in, a, in another newspaper, I automatically find out about it. So it's interesting reading it. I would say, and he gets quoted, like, or, or not quoted or, or just written about him in all papers across the country. It'll be the Okanagan, it'll be Barry, it'll be Halifax, usually in context of. Uh, for example, recently it was all about conflict of interest. So the, the Alto Citizen wrote an editorial about Rob Ford and his, what he did and why, why he shouldn't have done it on conflict of interest. And I, I was kind of shocked. I was like, if you didn't know better, you'd think he was the mayor of Ottawa. It was just really wasn't, there was no justification for writing about a Toronto mayor. A uh, lot of times it's in, in context of budget cutting. And uh, is it right, should we go down the Rob Ford road of uh, look at everything and try and cut, 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 cut? I, I would say overall, and this is not scientific, I'd say more of it was negative than positive. And I would say when I, when he first came in and he seemed to be having a lot of wins with Toronto Council, there was a lot more kind of like, wow, maybe this guy is okay, maybe this is a road we should follow. Since then, I would say it was mostly negative. In Chicago, because you mentioned it at the beginning, I mean, the interesting thing was there was so much press here about Mayor Ford going on his first kind of, you know, official road trip other than one little trip to Guadalajara where it was kind of just a ceremonial role. But here he is taking a team. There was so much press. And then you get to Chicago and, you know, he literally couldn't get arrested. Like, I mean, you just know the Chicago media was not covering him at all or the trip. They were all about the school strike that was just being settled. He got a little bit of press that was unflattering from, uh, uh, I think it was a uh, NBC yeah. blog that kind of made I, fun of him. I queued it up. I uh, can read that. Uh, okay. yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so for in the States, he had it was no profile at all. People were just like, who is this guy? Um, uh, which made it interesting, that, that kind of weird scrum at the, the bean sculpture where people were coming up to him and talking to him because there was TV cameras crowded around him, but they, that's the culture of celebrity. They, most of them didn't have any idea who he was, and he was handing out business cards to many of them saying, if you have any problems, give me a call. And we were all kind of like, why would this guy from Indiana give you a call? But he was just in Rockford, I'm meeting my people mode. And so, 
So it was a very strange dynamic. Yeah, I don't think people know. I, I didn't go to Chicago, but when I was in London, I was sitting with a reporter at the closing ceremonies. He's like, so what do you normally cover? I'm like, oh, I cover City Hall. He's like, oh, that's kind of boring. I'm like, it, you'd think it would be boring, but our mayor is like, like, crazy pants fun to cover he's like what do you mean and so i started going through a bunch of things and he's like are you kidding me is that real and i'm like yeah like that's and he's like what is going on like i don't know he's got this charisma that people love and he's like a fiscal he's kind of like chris christie a little bit which i think every now and then he gets compared to um but yeah so for <laughs> anyway he was like i can't believe i haven't read about this guy we're like i don't yeah i don't know Maybe, maybe in sort of municipal city staff circles, I think there is some word that leaks out just because he is such an unusual municipal politician. I know when I was doing prep for the Chicago trip and I phoned the Chicago Chamber of Commerce uh, and I started sort of asking, you know, it's a business mission if they reached out to you guys or are you aware of Toronto and the business links? And, and the, the guy who was basically the spokesperson for the chamber said, said, oh, you're mayor. Is he still trying to lose weight? <laughs> And I said, and I explained, and I said, yeah, and he kind of stopped, and then there was this sort of final weigh-in where he fell off the scale and kind of fell on his brother, and the guy laughed for like 10 minutes, and, and I'm not, I don't say that, but that's exactly what happened, so I think some of it leaks out into some circles, but I would say in Canada, he's extremely well-known and extremely commented on by all sorts of people, and uh, in the United States, not so much. Okay, we got time for one last question. We're going to take a five-minute break, but you've already had your chance. So. Anybody else? Sir? We make fun of them, but you're predicting you will get re-elected. I'd like to make fun of the people in Toronto for voting for <laughs> Okay, that's a good question to end on. The question was, uh, we like to laugh and make fun of them, but uh, you think he might get re-elected. Actually, what David said earlier was, if he's only facing one challenger, the odds are that uh, he might lose. If he's facing a multiple number of challengers, the odds are right now that he'll probably prevail. That was the answer. But nonetheless, uh, what's it say about the people of Toronto? Well, I'm not making fun of them. I, I think that, you know, people can make fun of him as you can make fun of any public figure. Um, and again, I think that there's, you know, he's, he's a funny guy. He does funny things that I wish in my heart that we had a daily show. That's all I think of all the time. I'm like, you know, this is not the appropriate place that we could, the star would ever do that or any mainstream media would do that would be appropriate. But God, if we had a daily show. Um, and he's an amazing campaigner. I was at Ford Fest um, and you listen to that guy give a speech to, you know, rally his troops. And he, you know, I think the mayor is actually a really shy guy. Um, and he doesn't like speaking in public um, on issues that he's not really comfortable with. And you can see it. Um, and he kind of clams up and he kind of stutters a little bit. Um, when he's in campaign mode and he's talking about the gravy train and $12,000 retirement parties and the wasteful spending and he's saving billions of dollars and these people down there at City Hall, they don't get you and I get you and look, I'm one of you and come here and have some burgers at my house and a beer and we can talk about football and... You know, we're not going to have the entitlements down there. We don't have... It. It's, it's, he just... I don't know what it is. It's like, you know, people who stutter and they sing and they can just do it and it just comes out? That's the mayor. When he's in campaign mode, he is, you know, pitch perfect a, a lot of the time. And so that's why I think that... And he also... He, he did in, in his speech, and I wish I didn't bring it, but he did rhyme off a lot of his accomplishments. And... Um, he, he has accomplished, you know, a lot of what he said he was going to do. A lot of it was not, you know, necessarily uh, attributed to his own personal actions, or a lot of it happened maybe despite of some of his blunders. But on a, you know, if you're talking about a 30 second sound bite, he can deliver one. And that's, a, you know, perhaps sadly, that's what politics is, is kind of about these days. So. Yeah, the other thing I want you guys to add is uh, I think the kind of serious thing that underlies a lot of the a lot of the fun as far as why is he remained so popular, uh, given all, all the things that have happened, is I mean there is the issue of Toronto being a mixture of uh, suburban voters and downtown voters, and it being a real difference in what those people feel and what they think is important. I mean, Ford came into office. I think it was a dynamic and a storyline created where people. Um, partly unsure by reality, also partly by some columnists in the city and a lot by talk radio, that uh, David Miller was 
sort of too far left, was more worried about global warming than it was about whether basic city services were being delivered. And, uh, and I think a lot of those people still believe that, and they think that the only person at City Hall that is really trying to rein in spending, rein in the unions, and basically deliver good customer service is Rob Ford and the people who agree with him. Uh, and I know, I know during the 2010 campaign, uh, where I knew that something was really going on with Rob Ford was, I, I grew up in central Etobicoke, and I was visiting my mom, and she's a retired librarian, she has a master's, she hangs out with a lot of other retired librarians who are very sort of educated middle class or upper middle class people who are not who you would might think be Rob Ford followers, and I, and I, she had just come back from a coffee clutch, and I said, so what were you guys talking about? And she said, oh, the, the election. And I was like, oh, you know, what are they saying? And she said, well, they're all for Ford, I'm for Rossi, but I might switch. And I was like, wow, okay. So the people that a lot of us assumed might not be Rob Ford voters, in fact, are. And so those people continue. And I guess it's up to the people who think Rob Ford is doing a bad job at City Hall to show that, in fact, they're wrong and that there are more important things in the city than the things that uh, he's uh, trumpeted over and over. Can I say one more thing? Really quick? Thank you, David. Can I say one more thing? Okay, my one more comment about talk radio, and in general, <laughs> other media, some, I think other media, quite frankly. I think the other thing with Rob Ford that works in his favor is that because they have successfully cultivated this narrative that the media, like very Fox News, the left-wing media and elitists are out to get him, um, I believe, and from what I see in coverage, that people are hesitant to call him when he struggles with the facts. Um, a lot of the time, you know, he'll say something and media will write what he says and then kind of give the other side of the story and then kind of say what he says and then go on as opposed to just saying, and that's not true. And I think that the first time that we really saw media writing and that's not true is with this football misusing city resources stuff. Um, people were actually, in his statement, he was saying, you know, um, left-wing counselors are going after my staff and you know they can't defend themselves and that was the first time I ever saw anyone besides the star quite frankly write in copy no one was going after his staff and I think that's something is that people are almost easier on him uh, maybe his supporters would say otherwise but I think media is actually easier on him because they have cultivated this narrative that everyone's out to get him and you don't want to look like you're piling on and that's something that I, I think um, is a failing of, of the people who are covering the mayor because you can love him and uh, you know hail his accomplishments but you've also got to sometimes say wait a minute that number is not actually true and I'm gonna write that you said that, that the wrong number and a topic for another day which is that one fascinating thing about him is that in his staff is the expectations of a, of a mayor have changed in Toronto and people a lot of people are willing to let him get away with Things as far as saying things that are not true, or perhaps reflecting things in a way that doesn't affect, doesn't reflect reality, and then it kind of affects us. I mean, that you maybe some other reporters say, well, if people don't really care about it, then maybe we just back on what they're saying does not reflect reality. And lots of that makes us very unpopular. Well, we, we didn't let you guys get away with anything for the last hour, so I just want to thank you. Irene, David, Robin, you know, for people who are, uh, as the mayor says, intellectual, elitist, socialist, sit on your ass, do nothing, folks. Uh, I think you've proven that uh, you can sit on your ass and still work hard for an hour. So. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. We'll be back in about five minutes. much attention, I think, sometimes as we should or we used to, to uh, what you might call the little people, meaning uh, the unfortunate, the people who don't have money.